I wanted to talk to everybody about the gravity flyer. Now I've taken some time off from showing everybody videos and stuff on this, but I'm going to get back into it so that I can show you where I am now. So first thing that we need to talk about is our flyback transformer. So when you guys have one of these right here, I need you to understand something about this. This is a unique piece of machinery here. And if you don't take them apart, you wouldn't understand this. This right here is your hot wire. It's in closest to the actual core. There's your soft metal right there. It's into the center of the core. Now, on the outside of that, you're going to have film. And it's going to be in plastic. And then on the outside of there, it looks like mylar. But it's just copper wrapped around that. And in each one, it goes through, and it actually, as the magnetic field goes through it, it creates a diode. So it's a one-way diode. What happens is, is all of the pins on the bottom of one of these is set to each one of those layers. So it comes out, and it's potential. It's not a magnetic volt like the other side is. This side's close into the core. So it's going to have a magnetic signature to it. This side will not. It will be potential. That's going to be your negative side. So what happens in our gravity flyer when we know this? You know that the top disc is getting a magnetic volt in it, right? You're getting magnetics going on. It won't stay on the aluminum because of the way the aluminum does with any currents. So it'll stay right on the outside of that disc. But it'll come right around it just like this. And you'll get a field that grows right there that's a magnetic field. However, on the bottom, because it comes out as potential instead of a magnetic field, you're not going to get the same thing. That's why they put magnets on the bottom of the gravity flyer. So you see the magnets in there, you see them rotating, but there's not a magnetic field in the voltage that comes into it from the high voltage. So you need to add that to it. That's why he puts magnets on it. So the question always comes up, why do you not have magnets on the top? Because it doesn't need it. You already have a magnetic field there. You have the magnetic field on the bottom from the magnets. And you have the voltage that comes in. Each one of them is different. So placement in where you put the actual pickup has to be different. On the bottom, you put it close in towards the center. Because you want the voltage to go out. Hit the magnetics on the outside on the bottom there with the mag magnets themselves. And create that field. Then it interacts correctly. So the actual part that you put in has to be close in right to where the actual thing turns right there on your fan motor. Now, on the top, you don't want that. You want the field to be more on the outside. You want to hit it on the edge mostly. You do not want any dissipation there in that magnetic field. So you can't place it inside towards the center. If you say there's a center, you can't place it right here you're going to have to place it out here. So, general rule, probably two inches, maybe two, two and three quarters, three inches, somewhere like that, is where you want the top one. It will matter. Okay? So, just so you know, you have to have them coupled. And I've always said this, and I don't think people really understand it. So, let me go into this just a little bit. The reasoning for the coupling. And I don't care which one you're working on, whether you're working on the one with the metal center plate or without it. It still matters on this one aspect. Couple them. Now, what voltage are you coupling them with? That's something that people never talk about. I've never seen anybody else talk about it, so let me explain it to you. When you deal in high voltage, there is a distance calculation you have to do in order to tell what exact field that you're putting out. So, we all know the simple one. Put it in close and you get sparks. That's, that's an easy one. Pull it out a little more you get plasma. That one's known as well. We do plasma displays in that. Pull it out a little more you get a scalar field. Okay? That one's not very well known and not very well understood. You pull it out a little more and you get pure charge. Now, most people don't understand that one either. However, hopefully by the end of this video you will understand it better. These are all the different fields that come out when you deal in high voltage. Staying in those fields is very important. So when you set up your two plates, your upper and your lower one, you say, well, what if you have a metal disc in the middle? How is it translating? It's because the Tesla field that's created in there 
will not allow it to stay on that center plate. That's why you charge up your high voltage first. It uses the center plate as a screwdriver in between your high voltage. So if you set it this far apart and not getting any spark on it, you put your screwdriver in the center and it'll make a bridge to both of them. And it'll create the sparks to both. That's the answer there. So when you do that and you have the center plate that's solid, it'll connect right there. Now, this is where it gets tricky. Because it's in there, you're going to have to calculate the distance on your top one and your lower one in different ranges. Okay, Based on the amount of electricity and magnetic voltage you have in there. So, you're going to have to create the top one shorter to the center plate. Now, it'll be different if you have a plastic center plate because you're just dealing with two discs. This one with the metal center plate, you have to worry about that at first amount of distance. It's got to be able to get to there first. Then the secondary amount of distance. This one can be longer. That's why you see the offset in the way you do. Now, that being said, now that we understand what we're looking for, we know the range. We want the scalar range. That's it. We do not want it to change. Now, high voltage will sometimes lie to you when it comes to watts. Not when it's done in amps and volts. Watts are a liar in this system. They're great for calculating watts and joules. Very bad at calculating how your high voltage works. So, when you add heat to any high voltage, it brings up the amount of amps. When you take away the heat and you add cold, it'll bring your frequency up and it'll also bring in more volts. So, if you know that, then calculating these fields are going to be a lot easier. But it's still a trick to do it. Why? Because inside your garage, you're going to get one result, which is going to try to tell you, hey, this is the way the temperature is everywhere. This is the way we can reproduce it. But that in itself isn't correct either. So if there's more heat in your garage, if there's less heat in your garage, if you don't have a temperature controlled, there's a problem. If you have your air conditioner running straight on it, that's going to be a problem. It's going to set off the amount of volts and amps in your system. Just like changing the frequency, just like starting a lighter next to it, just like adding different things to it. You have to take it into account. Now, once you do, this makes it easier to understand. When you're outside and it's hot, you're going to have more amps in your voltage when it comes to high voltage. Why? Because the sun's beating down on the discs themselves. That right there is going to tell you, hey, we got some more heat in the system. Therefore, we're, it's going to bring up the amps and it's going to bring down our voltage. It's also going to change our frequency. Man, this voltage likes to jump around. You have to remember, this is not a voltage that stays inside the wire. This is a free flow voltage. It will, vo it will come outside the wire and jump. When you have that, the environment changes how things work. So, when there's more heat, the actual amps go up and the frequency goes down. Account for that. Then when you're inside, you'll actually be in a cooler environment or a normal environment, and then they'll stay close to the same where you set your dials and gauges. That's all well and good. But what happens when you start adding a Tesla coil field to the center that is not attached directly to your Tesla coil? You see, that's another major difference that people are talking about. So when you attach the center, your number two coil of your Tesla coil straight to your plate, what happens? The plate starts to heat up. Why? Because you're adding it as part of the number two coil in that way. So it'll actually heat up the plate. Now, what does Alexi do? He puts it down the throat of the coil. The throat of the coil is cold. It's going to create cold energy. You are stealing that energy by putting a load on it. The gravity flyer is your load. Therefore, cold energy on the plate. How do you know that you got your distance correct on your two plates when it's running? It's because the temperature in the center will drop. When you can get that temperature to go into the 40s, instead of the 70s where your room temperature is, you know you've created the correct field. It's a variable that you have to take into account here. 
it's not the easiest thing to do, especially when you have a metal center plate. If you have a plastic one, it goes fairly easy. It's fairly straightforward. Just get it set, know your distances. It's gonna go right through, penetrate right through that and connect. However, the field won't connect in that way. The field connects like this. It looks like an onion. It goes just like this. That's how the field is on a plastic center plate. But on the metal center plate one, it's different. It has to connect here to, into the center touch and then connect on the bottom and create the field. And then as you grow your Tesla field, you're taking the field from on the plate to off the plate. And then it just moves out until it gets to the edge. That's why the size of the actual plates matter. You'll notice that the smaller plate, you double it, you get the bigger plate. And you come down again. Or it's a square of two system. So it's a lot easier to understand this when you get that fact. There's geometry in this that you didn't think was there. It just is. It took a long time for my brain to wrap around that fact that there's geometry in this plate versus the upper and lower plate. I thought it was just voltage that connected between them. It's not. The amount of distance is mandatory that it be that so that it can create the thing and stay in and create the bottom one like this and it'll look like this shape. So when we start putting things into this from our Tesla coil, this is where people get confused. We are not adding hot energy into our gravity flyer. We are taking out cold energy. Cold energy can be multiplied when you get it cooler you need to bring the temperature down. Now, what's the best way of doing this? So, in my gravity flyer setup, my Tesla coil is such a different system than everybody else runs. I resonate my Tesla coil at 620 kilohertz. I then remove 310 kilohertz by putting my gravity flyer connected to a wire down the throat of it. That allows me to resonate at 310 kilohertz. You say, but if you add your gravity flyer to it, wouldn't be alone? Well, no. Not, not in the way that you're thinking of it. A top load is what you're thinking of, okay? I'm not creating a top load here. I'm creating it like I added wire to create those 310 kilohertz. That's kind of a difference, but it's also pulling energy out. I'm taking energy from my Tesla coil without disturbing the oscillation of it. You say, well, that's not normal. And normally if you say, I'm gonna take the energy out of a Tesla coil, disturb the oscillation and then cause problems because of the load. Well, not getting that. I'm getting something different. I'm creating cold energy in the center because I'm taking it out of the, the Tesla coil with a wire down the top. It's a completely different system. My Tesla coil operates differently than everybody else's. If you try to run it normally, you are going to be completely out of the realm of resonance. You have to have your gravity flyer attached to the Tesla coil that I use in order to put it in resonance. That's why my system's different than everybody else's. And there's a couple more things. I know how to create heat in the system in order to use it, but I can't use all of it I cannot create an explosive voltage. I need the voltage to be implosive. Okay, it must come in and take in more energy from the surrounding area. Therefore, we get into one of the last parts I wanna talk about today. And it has to do with that scalar field. If you're in the correct field, what happens? The bubble that you create with your Tesla coil on the outside pulls in the scalar energy. If you do not do this correctly, you fill it with static volts. That's a problem. You're in the wrong area. You're close, but you're in the wrong area. How did Alexei know which area he was in? What, what, how did he know which field he was in? It's the red light bulb test. When he turned on the red light bulb, I always thought he was smoking in the background. It wasn't. He was pulling in a scalar field 
And as he did that, everything else in that field came out. Every other electron, every other thing that was in there pulled out. It just all came out and it looked like it was smoking away. Well, it was for a very specific purpose. He actually did that test so that he could see on those little pieces of foil as they settled on that thing just like this. He wanted to see if he can see the actual scalar field coming in or if it was blowing out. That's what he was doing there. Everybody else thinks he just wanted to see something crazy or whatever. He changed the camera so that you can see the field. He blurred it slightly. That's something that everybody else is probably confused on as well. Why would he do that? Well, because he knew that he could see it. He knew where the field was. It, it was directly just like this. It wasn't going anywhere else. It was just like this. He could actually see the field, the bubble he was creating. And he can see when it filled up. He just timed it. He just timed how long it took to fill that up. So then when you see the test later on and he goes to lift it, all he's doing is telling you an exact amount of time. Because he knows in a controlled environment, this is the amount of time it should take. Now, could it be off? Yeah, because its temperature in the room could be different. That's why sometimes it lifted, sometimes it didn't. He didn't hit the multiplication on energy because he didn't pull enough into his field. That's something that people don't understand, but it showed up in his testing. As soon as he hit the button and it didn't go, and you saw a little bump, or you saw it tip over, you knew. He just didn't put it in the right thing. He ran the motors the same. He didn't get enough energy into the system. So let's talk about that a little bit. When you want to pull the energy into this system, okay, there's one way to definitely know you have it you'll actually see the high voltage start to spark over if, the, if you leave anything in there that's a short distance. It'll start to rapidly spark over. It's not a little bit, it's a lot. It starts to pick up a lot of extra energy. Why? Because it's pulling it from that Tesla coil faster. And as it pulls it, the Tesla coil builds more. That's how you pull the energy from there into cold energy. You're making more of a draw. That's what's going on as well. You're coupling because you're coupling on the two plates. You're pulling a draw into the system. That's the whole point. You're creating a moment right in the center of that gravity flyer where everything pulls into it. Even though the wire is connected out here, it still pulls it directly into the center. When we did high voltage testing, what'd you see? It started to go around it and it came right back to the center. Start going around it, start coming back to right center. When I ran it in reverse on the top, it did the same thing. It's telling you that there's a point in the center where the energy is pulling in. That's your scalar energy. That's the cold electricity you need to pull in. Now, if you can get to the point where you understand that, comprehend how each part works, and then you can pull the energy in, what's going to happen? The outside will get hot. You say, well, why would the outside get hot? It's because the inside's so cool. It'll burn your finger. Every time you put it on there on the outside, it'll burn your finger. But it will not have a massive temperature difference. You'll see when he did the light bulb test, the outside was just a little warmer. The inside was cold. It didn't even really register what it was on temperature because it looked like it wasn't there in the red light bulb test. I applaud Alexi all day for doing that test. It wasn't infrared, but he was able to see the field. If you can understand the way I'm telling you he did it and look back on it, you'll see that right answer too. So, now that we have that, where do we go from here? We have our Tesla coil totally different. We need to create a moment before explosion. Of t and it'll be total implosion. Sounds wrong, right? But it is. It's right. What happens? You're pulling that energy, right? Now, there's a moment where you put in a little bit of heat, and what happens? It wants to start to explode, right? It's building, building, building energy, and then what do you need to do? You need to stop before it hits the moment of explosion. You want to create the most massive amount of energy you can before the moment of explosion. 
the moment of explosion ruins the experiment and you have to start over. You want to create the mass amount of energy in the center and you want to be able to use as much of it as you can before explosion. You're creating implosion into this thing. That's the point. Now, we get into the piezoelectric disc. Now this is something that people don't understand either. They think that you can push it and I showed testing where it just started just tapping the center plate. What's the problem? Well, when you run your motors and it doesn't catch on the high voltage and slow down certain motors, what starts to happen? You get the tinking effect. Tink, 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 tink. What does that mean? It means you're hitting that center plate hard and it's moving the metal but it's not touching the diaphragm that you need to correct, correctly put in the center. So when it goes tink, 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 that's a problem. When it pushes the diaphragm that you're trying to create in the center like this, just like a smooth motion, okay? That's what you want. Again, we're changing the singer. We're putting them from out of tune to in tune. Now, what does that mean? You could be in a different key every time that the thing builds in the actual ring of the Tesla coil energy or, or the center plate energy or the magnetic energy that you're creating. All three of them show up on the oscilloscope. All three go together when you have them in phase and they amplify together. If you are in the wrong octave, you will not get the right energy put into that system. You will not even get close to the moment of explosion. You will not even be anywhere near the amount of energy you need for this craft. You have to put it in the correct first. He pushes the button once. He pushes the button twice. He puts the third, fourth, fifth time it lifts. He is in the fifth octave when it lifts. That is the octave of aluminum. That's why it's all aluminum as well. There's multi-features in that aluminum and don't discount it. This is why he does it, okay? You have to get to that moment right before it explodes where you have the most amount of energy and it stays there. Why? Because the aluminum lights it there. It does not come out of that. When he pushes the button again, it does not come out of that octave. It stays there once it's found its place. Now, each time that you're able to put this thing in and the energy comes, it has to grow. And then, boom, it hits the peak. You have to pulse it at the peak. Then it comes down and pushes out the energy. So you're amplifying the amount right there. You're going from kilohertz to megahertz right there in that second. And then, boom, it comes down and pff, out the energy. Now. If you put too much, you get an explosive energy. It'll poof, that little gravity flyer, okay? That's fun, but it's not helping, okay? You're going to need to get to that moment like a diaphragm. You have to see it that way. You can't see it as metal. See it in your head as a diaphragm. It needs to go like this. That's what needs to happen when you push that button, just like this. If it starts doing this, no good. Start over. And it takes a while to start over. So, guys, just understand this. There's ways to get around some of this stuff to make the process go faster. But just understanding the process in itself is probably the best thing you could do at this point. This thing is not a simple piece of junk that you put together and throw away the rest of it. It's not loosey-goosey. It's not any of those things. You see... I also had to change some of the ways that I was building this thing in order to take care of the properties that it needed to. The piezoelectric disc sitting against the you know housing that was flat on the top, bad idea. I opened mine up. I have a hole like this and it sits in there and locked in there like this and there's a hole. I even in one of my other models created a hole all the way down just straight to the motor so that I can affect that top plate more. So it's very important how you build things along with knowing what's going on in each thing. Again, when we talk about this right here, understand it. This is going to have magnetic voltage coming out of it. What does that mean? It's going to create a magnetic field. This is where your amps come from right here. 
because it's so close to the center core itself. The little ones down here, when you find the ground, the ground is going to have potential coming out because it's built as a one-way diode. It also has a resistor built in. Because of the material wrapping it, it acts as a filter for the energy to go through. Now, when you can understand this, you'll understand the scalar field and how you build it. What a lot of people start doing is they put high voltage in it and they think, I'm just going to spark this thing over. And I've showed this a lot of times because I have fun with high voltage. It doesn't work. It's not what you need. It's counterproductive. Although the voltage does tell you where it wants to go, and that's important to see because you want to see exactly how it flows into something. However, it's counterproductive in the way of building the correct field in the center. You must, a must, to find this thing, you must get the center of it colder. If you cannot get the center of it colder than the average room temperature, something is wrong with your system and you need to find out why. Something's wrong with the distance in your plates. Something's wrong with the magnets you're using. Something's wrong. What other thing when we start talking about magnets? Why I don't use neodymium magnets anymore. They heat up the center plate and use the energy as it's being created. Now, for those of you who don't understand high voltage and how frequency, temperature, everything changes the high voltage, this is going to be a problem to understand. However, for those of you who do, this should be a fairly simple understanding. Neodymium magnets create too much eddy current in the center plate, which heats up the center plate so that the cold energy from the Tesla coil cannot cool, cool down that thing and cannot create your field in the center. You will not create an ether. You just won't do it. It will never produce. You'll be able to create some of the effects and be able to create some small EMPs, but you won't be able to create the ether in there. You just won't. It's, it's not possible. You are using the energy as soon as you create it. That's the problem. So what do you have to do? I went to ceramic magnets because then the field goes around. And you say, well, man, you're getting a bigger field, okay? And it's going around, but you're not getting that much energy in there. Well, I don't need to because I have high voltage to give me the amount of energy I need. See, that's the thing. I have plenty of potential in there. Once I put it with the magnetism of the magnets, then guess what? I do have enough now. That's the understanding there. You don't need the magnets to overpower the system. You're going to ruin it. That's why you never use them. They say you use Alinko magnets. Well, yeah, that's the difference. It's what? 2,000 gouts in your uh, neodymiums, 1,000 gouts in your Alinko, and then probably even less than that in your ceramic. I prefer the ceramic in this system because it gives me the ability to, to be able to produce the field the way I want to. The Alinko magnets may have something better because they're made of aluminum. Therefore, they're going to resonate with the rest of it once you have this system in resonance. That's as simple as it gets. There's reasons why he uses things versus not using things. It wasn't just, let me, I found this in the junkyard today. No. He wanted specific parts for this for a reason. Everything in it has three to four different effects. That's the problem here. You have to break every part of it down. For those of you who said, I put high voltage and it doesn't work. Well, yeah. You know, I tried to create a doghouse and I just bought nails and two by fours and it didn't work. Why? Because I didn't put the effort into it. Well, now you know. Now you know what I'm going through. Now you know the effort it's going to take to get this thing off the ground. Now, it shows signs of working. Everything does. And those tests are coming, guys. So trust me, you're going to be very happy with those. But first, I need to get the understanding out there. And this is where I decided to start this time. There's a lot more terminology you can use here. I could actually tell you a ton of terminology, write the math on a board, but why? If I can't get you to understand the simple process, the math isn't going to help you. Okay, so I don't want to sit here and do it. So what I am going to tell you is how the process works so that you can better understand this and why I'm doing the things I'm doing. Now, a lot of this ties into the coil work that we're doing now as well. When you start to get these coils 
resonating correctly, you're going to get the scalar field. Now, a lot of you who have done this and have tried this thing and said, man, I made this star coil and it didn't do anything. You know, I could barely get the magnet to run. Well, there's a lot more to learn about it. And that's why we're doing the videos when we go live to show you guys this stuff. Because I think a lot of the information got taken away, taken out of YouTube where people couldn't get it. But now we're bringing it back in so that you understand it. Because in order to understand this little simple gravity flyer, you're going to have to start to understand it. Guys, I've been told that I need a million volts to lift this thing. Well, that probably might be right if I looked at conventional means of explosion to do it. But I'm not. I'm using implosion. Therefore, my numbers are going to be different. I'd love to see the calculators come out and do that one. Because that would be the greatest thing in the world to see. But I don't think they will. Not a lot of people understand potential and implosion. Because they don't. It's such a hard field to try to tell people about. You must create it in this system. You have to create the same type of energy this Earth does. And if you don't, if you continue to think AC just like man-made, DC that man-made, you're not going to get to the next level. When you start thinking about the energy the Earth creates, you're in the right area. That's where you need to be. Earth energy, not man-made energy. Okay? The Earth creates a saltwater battery. It does not create lead-acid batteries. Just understand this. There's a big difference in understanding here. Start to understand it on the level it wants you to understand it on. We need to create implosive energy. We need that cold side. We need that gravity flyer to be the pull on that energy from that Tesla coil. It has to be there. Man, if you don't put a Tesla coil on this thing, you're just wasting your time. I'm going to tell you that right now. It's one of the main things in a gravity flyer you absolutely have to have. You must, and it's a must, have that Tesla coil tuned in. It took me months, and I'm talking six months to get this thing even close, okay? I had several months without working with somebody. I had several months with work with somebody, and then, I, you know what I mean? It took me a little while to even tune it in further than that because it has to be very specific to your gravity flyer. It cannot be something rinky-dink, pull it out of nowhere, use it. It won't work properly. I tried it. I, I tried it. And I exploded so many uh, transistors and MOSFETs trying to do it. It is a simple understanding. Put the wire down it and find out what it does. Once you find out what it does, then learn how to use it. Okay? That's it. It starts right there. It starts with that very understanding. Your high voltage matters because of the way he's creating it and for the reasons he's creating it, not for the reasons you think it is. If you don't understand high voltage, if you do not know why when you put higher frequency the amps drop, or in your system if there's unwanted heat somewhere, your amps will go up and your voltage comes down and your frequency comes down. If you don't understand that in your system, it's going to be very hard to control it because you're not accounting for it. Therefore, it's going to do random things that you don't expect because you can't see it. And that's where you go from the wrong state and being in a simple heavy charge to the right state to be in a scalar wave where you need to be. Guys, I don't know how much more I can explain other than that on this specific topic when we talk about the plates, when we talk about the magnets, when we talk about the voltages, when we talk about the test of coil. At this point, when you guys start to build this thing and it gets there, man, it's going to be beautiful. You guys will be right where I am, okay? You're going to start to see everything. Your scopes are going to line up on this stuff. You're going to start to line up three rings. You're going to then start to amplify those three rings, which, by the way, is the point where you need the Arduino in there so that you can actually set this thing up on a timing system to do it. Then you really got something special, okay? That's the, probably the next step I need to start working on. Now, can you get it to pop a little bit? Sure you can. Yeah, you can. There's a way to do it, but you're going to use all the energy in it, and then you got to start all over, okay? 
maybe get you an inch off the ground. I think people would just like to see that. But you know what? It, it's kind of useless, to be honest with you. It's just useless. It gives you the wrong thing. It's like putting someone on a scale and saying it's anti-gravity. It's just not. It's not anti-gravity at all. It's, it's pressure. It's static electricity creating pressure on that scale. I can do it all day. It's not giving me anti-gravity. The thing with gravity is you must meet the energy and how it's built. If you don't, you won't get it. If you say, I need AC, I need DC, okay, let's just clean that out. It's not going to work. You must create potential. You must create the energy of the earth. You must create the ether inside the center. That's the understanding here. Make that diaphragm move slowly. Do not tink it. Slowly. Then you'll start to understand it. You'll start to get the process in your head. This is where we need to go from here. Guys, it's revolutionary. It's anti-gravity. It's not supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to be plug something into the wall and be done with it. It's supposed to be a process that takes time and understanding to even get close to it. Okay? It takes a ton of understanding to get to where I'm at. I sure hope for those who just put the electricity in there and say it doesn't work or that you think it's a string or whatever else you think it is, I would hope that you would do the test and find out. Don't believe me, do the test yourself and find out. Absolutely good with me, I'm happy with that. That way you get to see what I'm seeing because once you start seeing it, you're going to start building on it. Then you're going to get somewhere. But just theory alone will never get you to this point. Because there's no theory out there that really explains it the right way. So hopefully in me telling you this, you'll start to get closer to the right way. And then I bet you somebody's going to take it and redefine it for you. Probably in better terms than I can. However, I bring this to you guys so that you guys can start to understand this. We're going to start going back to testing so you can start seeing some of it. There are some cool things that happen in it. I'll show you all of them. That'll be coming up. But... First, we're going to do a little bit more understanding, and then we're going to start showing testing. Like I always do, understanding video, testing video, and then we'll see what it is. And we'll let you make your own determinations at the end. Guys, think what you want about this craft, but I'm going to get this thing to work because I truly do understand it. Anyway, with that said, I hope you have a great day, and I hope this helped you guys out in understanding this machine. Thank you.